Partitions only create boundaries. They do not create indexing and lay out the operating system needs to store data on them. A file system creates the necessary indexing and layout on the partition. Different operating systems use different file systems. In this video, I will explain the file system Linux uses. To explain the file systems, I have created five partitions on a new virtual disk. I use the fdisk command to create these partitions. You can use any disk management utility to create partitions. A disk management utility only creates partitions like these partitions. It does not create a file system on them. To use newly created partitions, first, we need to create a file system on them. Linux uses ext and xfs file systems. ext was the first Linux file system. It was used in early versions of Linux. ext2 was the second generation of the ext file system. It provides very basic features. It was developed in 1980. It was the default file system before RHEL5. EXT3 was the third generation of the EXT file system. It was the default file system in RHEL5. It was the first file system in the EXT series that supports the journaling mechanism. It supports a file up to 2 terabytes in size. EXT4 is the fourth generation of the EXT file system. This was the default file system in RHEL6. It uses a series of contiguous physical blocks on the hard disk known as extents. The extents are used to improve the performance of very large files. XFS file system was mainly developed for Unix by Silicon Graphics. Later it was adopted by most Linux distributions including RHEL. It was the default file system in RHEL7. This file system is based on 64-bit extent. It uses journaling for metadata operations. It supports file systems and files of sizes up to 8 exabytes. The only drawback of this system is that it does not support the shrink feature like ext3 and ext4. We use the mkfs command with the t option to create a file system on a partition. This command needs two arguments, the file system's name and the partition's path. It creates the specified file system on the specified partition. For example, this command creates an ext3 file system on this partition. This command creates an ext4 file system on this partition. This command creates an xfs file system on this partition. We can create a file system only on the partition that stores data. Since the extended partition does not store data, we cannot create a file system on it. An extended partition stores logical partitions. To store them, it uses a partition table. If we try to create a file system on it, the command finds this partition table and pauses the process. It prompts us to confirm the operation. If we confirm the operation, it creates a file system on the entire extended partition making the logical partitions inaccessible. You should never do this. We use logical partitions to store data. We can create file systems on them. Let us create a file system on the logical partition. To use a partition, we need to mount it on the Linux file system. So far we haven't mounted the partitions we have created. Since we haven't mounted these partitions, we can use them to save data. To verify it, let us try to create a directory on this partition. Since this partition is not mounted, we cannot create a directory or file on it. To use this partition to save data, we need to mount it on the file system. To mount a partition, we need a mount point. A mount point is an access point of the partition. We use a directory as a mount point. Anything we save in that directory saves in the mounted partition. Let us create two directories. We will use these directories to understand the concept of the mount point. We use the mount command to mount a partition. This command needs two arguments, the absolute path of the partition we want to mount and the directory on which we want to mount it. This command mounts this partition on this directory. Now, we can use this partition to save data. To verify it, let us create a directory and file. We can use the cat command to create a simple text file. This directory and file will be saved on this partition. To verify it, we can unmount this partition and list this file and directory again. To unmount a partition, we use the umount command. This command needs the mount point's name as an argument. Now let us list this directory again. As we can see here, this directory is empty. The file and directory we created in this directory were actually saved in the partition we mounted on this directory. To verify it, let's mount the partition on the second directory we created for the testing. Now list this directory. This is the file and directory we created for testing. It verifies the data we save in the mount point directory actually saves in the partition that is mounted on that directory. 
the mount command mounts a partition temporarily. If we want to mount a partition permanently, we need to create an entry in the FS tab file. The kernel reads and uses this file at the boot time to mount partitions. If we want to mount a partition permanently, we need to create an entry for that partition in this file. Before we create entries for our partitions, let us take the backup of the current file. A backup copy allows us to restore the system to a working state if we make any mistakes. To mount a partition, we need the absolute path of the partition and a directory. We can use the fdisk command to view the full path of all partitions. To mount these partitions, we need to create directories. We will use these directories to mount these partitions. Now let's open the fs tab file and create entries for our partitions. A fs tab entry has six fields. The first field describes the name of the device or partition we want to mount. Since we are mounting partitions, we will specify the partition name in this field. The second field describes the mount point's name. In this field, we will specify the directory's path we created for this partition. The third field describes the file system this partition has. The fourth field describes the mount options associated with the file system. For practice, you can use the default option here. In the fifth and sixth fields, we use a value of zero. The dump command uses the fifth field to determine whether the mounted device or partition needs to be dumped during the boot time. The fsck command uses the sixth field to determine whether it should check the file system on the mounted partition or device. To enable these options, we need to use a value of one in these fields. If we enable these options, it will improve system performance but increase the boot time. On a production system, based on your requirements, you can enable these options. Since we created these partitions only for practice, we do not need to enable these options. Save the file. To test these partitions, we need to restart the system. The kernel uses the fs tab file to mount partitions at boot time. If it fails to mount any partition, it halts the boot process. If the system boots normally, it verifies all partitions specified in the fs tab file have been mounted successfully. After the login, we can also use the lsblk command to verify the newly created partitions. We created partitions on this disk. We can access a partition through its mount point. For example, we created a file on this partition. Let us list and view that file to verify the partition. That's all for this video. If you have any suggestions, comments, or feedback about this video, please share them in the comment section given below.